Welcome to the 91 Untold Change Project. I'm Neil Armand, your host for today's episode. And today we're going to be talking to Marcus Harris, who's CEO of Inside Inside, a, a consultancy firm that works particularly uh, with chief information officers in, in organizations, helping them to be disruptive. Uh, but for some of you who are as old as I am, uh, you may also know him from his part as Julian in the BBC's Famous Five production back in the late 70s. And I think that's part of why I wanted to talk to Marcus today, that he has got this incredible ability to recreate himself and uh, and turn on a dime and suddenly come up with a new way of doing things and I think in today's disruptive world that just seems like such a useful quality to explore for the change project one of the things that he said uh, during this interview was if you define yourself by what you've done then you can't change to be what you need to be and I, I think again that energy uh, really sings to the disruption that, that Marcus brings in a, in a really positive way to his stuff in acting, his stuff in, in business, and, and even in politics. So, hope you enjoyed the show. I really look forward to presenting it. Welcome to the 91 Untold Change Project. The, the whole universe is in a state of entropy. If you can unlock that higher motivation, they'll be with you. How do you create an environment where people can find meaning at work? That can create the needed culture change. How does radical change happen? You know it's a good business. In terms of our evolution, we were not required to have a conscious understanding of complex systems. What creates great innovation in the social arena? It does it for you taking action. Have some real sense of control over our lives. <laughs> Marcus, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure having you here today. One of the things I've always enjoyed about our conversations is we move between spaces. And it's like one of the things I like about your career and everything you do is you blend work as a, a very successful businessman, you know, a, a career in politics to a large degree, acting, uh, and so many other things together into this wonderful space how do you do that? What, and, and what does that entail? What, what's important within that space for you? Um, how do I do it? Uh, prob probably my wife would say not enough time at home. <laughs> and I think it's, it's refusing to be uh, pigeonholed as something. Refusing to say, well, this is, this is how my life has gone and so I'm going to be um, an X, Y, Z. Um, and I think it's also being driven by excitement. If I stop and analyse what really motivates me it's something exciting happening and all too often people can sit back and wait for something exciting to happen and of course it never does and then you die or you sit in your you sit in your, your deck chair looking out thinking oh I wish I'd had more excitement in my life and it's people who will just get off their bottoms and go out and make excitement happen put them put themselves in the way of opportunity and see where that takes you and I think that's probably how I've ended up doing as many things as I do and loving them. Wonderful. And what's the excitement that you're making happen at the moment? Um, business is very exciting for me right now. Right. So um, everything that we're doing in this, this sort of rapidly growing business, uh, been growing at about 30% uh, per year since we set it up four or five years ago, working with a really great bunch of people who are all similarly excited by finding uh, great opportunities to, to help CIOs, IT leaders with mm. the transformation and disruptive projects that they're working on. So that's probably that. But then, then if I end up on a film set somewhere and I'm, I'm sat with a bunch of lovely cameras on me, <laughs> then I'll find that probably more exciting for the period I'm at. Or it's very hard to say sitting in a council meeting could ever be seen as exciting mm. But actually, some of the things you can influence and change when you're working within politics is great. And that's all excitement. That's all <laughs> taking stock of a minute and thinking, yeah, do you know what? I'm alive and life is great. And how do you do that? How do you? Yeah, because a lot of people don't take a minute and put as much into it as you. So what is it that actually enables you to do that? Are there beliefs behind that or how do you do it? Um, beliefs? I'm not sure there's a belief. I think it is just 
just itchy feet to do the next exciting thing. Um, I'm not a great believer in sitting still for too long. Right. You know, there comes a time of an evening when I'm back home and that's it. I'll just collapse in the in the sofa and, and I'm there. But generally speaking, if there's a day, then there's things to do in a day. And there's, there's say, you can, you can just get things going and make things happen. So no, no, no fundamental belief system behind it, I don't think. Okay. And how do you manage your energy to achieve that? Because again, change requires energy. We need to drive things forward and again a lot of people these days are, are kind of struggling uh with getting the energy to create that momentum any thoughts on how you do that or is it just naturally occurring within your body that's a that's a really good question and i'm certainly not somebody who who sort of believes in some regi- regimented diet of of um healthy foods although i i have now started drinking celery juice in the morning but that's just because I find it fills me up brilliantly and doesn't have any calories in it. So it's <laughs> got to be good. Um, but it's it's about this amazing life, uh, and I it, it's, it's going to sound really cliched. <laughs> so you might have to cut that bit, Mason. But you know, it, it, this this life is exciting. There are, there are things going on everywhere that are new to learn about, and there are new challenges and things you've not faced before. And I think if you if you sit in a repetitive job that you don't enjoy doing the same thing every day for someone that you don't enjoy working with, life is going to seem really grim and you're going to get old very quickly. Yeah. Uh, You know, we were just talking before we came on air that I'm I'm now thinking that at some stage, I'm 55 now, um, some stage over the next five years, it would be great to go and fulfill a childhood ambition and go to drama school. I never actually did that because I got taken away into um, other other things life took me in another direction and I went with it but maybe I'll go back to drama school and maybe I'll come out at age 62 63 and 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 just commit myself to being a full-time actor again you know it's it's all about this there's no there's no plan I'm not following a plan if I was following a plan I'd be so bored I'd lose all my energy right so I guess I'm swinging back around to answer your question now it's about the fact that I keep feeding wood on the energy fire and wood is experience and learning and doing things that excite me and excite others around me and bring people on, on that sort of journey. So it, it's like a fire. Keep putting wood on it. It keeps getting brighter and stronger and hotter. If you don't give it any fuel, it will eventually go out to grey embers and that's a very sad way to live. Super. And so do you, with that fire... I get there's no plan, but do you check in on it? Is it you know, is there a process you go through unconsciously around that? I suppose I'm really interested because I'm hearing a real resilience to change in this or an, an embracing of change that quite a few people struggle with. So is there a, a loop that you go through? Do you keep checking in? Am I on track? Or is it just as long as there's something on the fire, I'll go somewhere and I don't know where that is? Over life, we... We're encouraged by our parents to um, learn to do things, use the, use the toilets and learn to walk and learn to talk. And these are all good things. And it's great. And we learn at a great rate of knots. And then you go to school and school starts saying to you, oh, oh dear, you really can't paint, can you? So you think, OK, well, I can't paint. Or yeah. what a great painting that really, you did really well. And you think, mm, do you know what? I don't want to let this person down. Perhaps I won't try painting again in case I can't do as well as that. But you start to be streamed by school and they start to bring in careers advisors and they start to create this vase, this beautiful crystal vase that you grow in your life. And as you, as you grow and you go through school and you think, well, next step, I suppose, is, is sixth form college or, or college. Yeah. I'll go and do that. And you go there and then you streamlined even further. It's one of two or three subjects that you go to learn. And then eventually you get through that and you think, well, university is the next step. I, I need to go to university. So then you're doing one or two things. And then you do that and then you come out and you've already created this vase for yourself. You've built a personality based on who you've been as a kid. Yes. Um, you've built, a, a, in, in a lot of cases, you've, you already know what you're going to do. You've learned to be a doctor or you've trained to be an engineer or, or you've trained in film and dance or whatever. And it then starts to create this funnel and you feel you have to keep going down it. And so my guidance is take the glass vase and smash it on yeah. the floor. Break it now. Smash it smash it and then you've got to stand back 
and say, I've got a whole host of new problems now. I've smashed that. I don't have any income. I've still got to pay for the family. I've still got to do these things. But do you know what? I've got lots of bits of broken glass and I can actually start making that into something new and something that I may want it to be. And it might end up being exactly the same as it was before, but that's okay because you've explored it. Yes. That's interesting because you're talking about smashing the vase there. And I'm hearing disruption in that. I mean, we quite often talk about disruption in business and indeed you mentioned it with the CIOs and how you work within Inside Inside. Um, But I'm hearing real disruption is necessary even within our own lives these days. Would you agree with that? There's a question there somewhere. I think we are currently entering the most disrupted phase of our of our lives yeah. um, and, and indeed our forefathers lives with everything that Brexit's doing everything that new technology is doing the world's changing around us our country and, and, and what we know in the UK is changing it's all changing and I think if you carry on trying to hang on to the branch that you know just because you know it not because you enjoy it or because it's right or relevant. So you're, you're, uh, you're old enough to remember, as I am, the, the chain of blockbuster video stores where we used to sort of pop down there. It's really exciting, all these major blockbuster yes. films that you only got access to when you went in this magical store and you choose them, you take them home. And the people who ran that probably believed this. And, and at the time, I thought, oh, wow, you know, this is, this is the future going and hiring these little black plastic boxes, putting them in my machine and sitting back and watching it, watching television, watching films. And, and then, of course, Netflix, Netflix come along and say, well, we'll post them to you. And then Netflix then evolve into the digital downloads. Yeah. And, and anybody who's a, a videotape manufacturer or a videotape retailer has got no future. And if they sit back and say, well, do you know what? I make videotapes. That's my job. That's what I've learned that's all I'm good for, I better go and retire. Um, what is, and that's the reason yeah. why we all have to change. Our, our retail sector is under massive pressure right now. More and more people are switching away to ever more effective ways of buying online. Um, banking is changing completely. We're losing another 300 RBS stores, I think, because people don't use the branches. Yes. And where you've got branches now still on the high street, they're becoming like little lounge seating areas for advice and guidance. And they, they realize they've got to change. So the traditional um, Mrs. Slocum on this is showing my age again. Mrs. Slocum <laughs> on the are you being served of hovering around counters. It's all changing. And if what you are is an amazing salesperson in a shop, there might not be a job for you soon. Yes. And if you define yourself by what you've done, then you can't change to be what you need to be. So if you think about the changes that that Brexit's bringing, that technology's bringing, that society's bringing right now, if you don't make personal change, you're going to end up being increasingly unhappy, being forced. You know, if if you make videotapes, well, you're going to be forced to go and do something else, making plastic boxes somewhere, and it might be something you don't enjoy. You might have loved the videotape business, but making plastic boxes (laughs) for golf clubs or whatever... Is not quite the same. Again, a, a little bit like a, a sort of a, of a young lady that I that I was had had some conversations with recently on a, a coaching yeah. sort of conversations where she was making herself ill, butting up against a glass ceiling that was never going to go away in this in this very specific sector that she worked in. Uh, there were no other jobs in this sector within the geography. There was no way that she was going to be able to get past some of the misogynistic beliefs in that organization. And she couldn't see where else to go. She had a mortgage to pay. And, and I said to her, as I just said to you now, is break the vase. Yeah. Smash it to pieces. It's going to be horrendous because you've got so many new problems to deal with. But they're new problems. And with new problems, you get a new energy. And with that new energy, you can then go on and rebuild. So to swing right the way back to your original question, (laughs) businesses need to be disruptive if they're going to maintain their markets. Shops have to change. They have to become destinations. Otherwise, people won't travel out to them. Um, If businesses have to change, technology has to change to support it. And indeed, 
disruptive technology is driving the growth of our country, driving the growth of, of the developed world, if you like. And if you're not at the forefront of that, thinking about new ways of doing things, then you're falling behind. And it's, it's an old cliche, but it's true. If you're not actually pushing the digital agenda, pushing um, new technologies and what they can do for efficiency, for effectiveness, for, for market yeah. penetration. And so if you're doing all of that as a country and as a, as a business, then people need to change with it and people need to be prepared to jump off that jump off that, that, you know, to throw that glass floor, vase on the floor and say, I need to do something different. I need to be different. So I'm, I'm going to find the energy to do it. Yeah. I mean, one of the, the, the presuppositions of NLP, you and I were talking about NLP in the car, which, you, again, um, needs to evolve, needs to change, needs to be looked at in a different way. And one of the presuppositions is if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. So if what you're doing isn't working, do anything else mm. uh, and it's one of the ones that, that's always struck me that anything else bit is what I'm hearing in in what you're talking about with smashing the, the vase looking at things differently coming at it from a another perspective you've mentioned Brexit a couple of times and I'm gonna go there if that's okay um, just for anyone listening we don't always release these within three days of, of recording them. So to give you a timestamp on where we are, we're recording this in the week that the independent group suddenly became a thing in Parliament. By the time we release this, I don't know, there might be some huge party in and of themselves, or there might be 12 new parties there. How long are you planning before you release this? I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but that could be next week. Um, let's discuss. What's the opportunity here? What, because quite often in the press... Um, we're looking at the, the downside of this. I'm, I'm not hearing in the conversation we've had today that that's a place that you spend a lot of time looking. What are the, what are the opportunities? And I guess within that, what are the, the, the challenges, but how can, we, how can we get ready for them? How can we do something about it? Uh, because there is some great stuff, regardless of what it is, because we don't yet know. Mm. I believe that we'll start to see something once Brexit's out of the way that will start coming up from nowhere. It could be Kickstarter funded. Um, it, it could just be a social movement on social media that starts to gain traction. And all of a sudden we might end up seeing people standing for election all over the country that have got no affiliation to either one of the parties that are currently there. Don't believe that you have to play by the Westminster rules, are happy to be value-driven individuals that will go out there and start to create a new dynamic and a new way of working. And even with our first-past-the-post system, I could see that starting to gain momentum. And there's so many disillusioned voters out there right now that they might just start to go towards this sort of centre-ground thing. As I say, I think the independents are probably too much of the old school. They're probably too much of the old style politicians. Um, whatever, however fresh they make themselves look, they're probably still going to be moribound by the same rules, the same structures, the same political infighting. And who knows, any new group might end up like that. But actually, yeah. you could start with something fresh and new that will make mistakes all over the place. But if they're prepared to just open up all the old issues and say, let's look at legalizing drugs. You know, yeah. What happens if we sell drugs in boots? What, what do we and tax them and, and put the money into healthcare and healthcare education? Our government, our two political parties won't open up that conversation. It's too much of a can of worms. They won't go into what does it mean uh, and realistically review it. Now, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not yeah. saying that any re report on it would, would, be, would prove that it was a good thing to do or not. But I think it should be looked at. And it's, this is about breaking the vase. What have we held dear? We've held dear. We, we've got a war on drugs and we fight drugs and we put millions and millions into police resourcing to try and fight it. And we prosecute young lads who happen to be smoking a spliff as they're walking down the high yeah. street and they become criminals then as they move through life there. And, and why do we do this? That's what we've got to understand. It's because it's we've, we've always done it like this. So break it and have a look at it again. So... I think, I think we could see, um, if, if it was led by a charismatic leader um, who could galvanise support around the community and get the publicity for it, we could see something new 
start to evolve after the Brexit decisions have been made and before we get to the next general election. And I think it could gather massive, massive speed very quickly and give us a difference. Again, breaking the glass vase and seeing what comes out of it. And you mentioned it should be values led. What values? It would the two the two main parties will produce this huge glossy manifesto that nobody ever reads. Um, or very few people read. And each party have these manifestos that set out what they will do if they get into power. If instead a party came up and said, you know what, there is no manifesto, there is no set of rules, because a new party wouldn't have the resources to create a fully funded, fully checked manifesto. But every time there's a decision to be made about how this country is governed and decisions that need to be made, we'll apply these values yeah. that have been agreed. These values that say about fairness, about economic prosperity, about equality. We'll apply these. And if you like these values, we promise to apply those values to every decision we make as a government. We're not going to give you a manifesto. We're not going to tell you what tomorrow looks like because tomorrow's tomorrow and it's going to be completely different. But this is how we'll make the judgments that allow us to actually reach that. I've got no idea. I'm, I'm not that level of politician. But <laughs> it's not beyond the wit of clever people out there to come up with a set of values that you can... Sure, you'll have disputes and sometimes a value will be misinterpreted one way or, or interpreted another way. But generally speaking, somebody out there could create a set of values that say we want our country yeah. run like this against these values. And every decision that we make will be according to those values. And that, I think, moves away from are you, are you, are you rich? Are you working class? So which way do you vote? It moves away from all of that and says, do you like these values? And if you do, whether you whether you're working in a, in a factory in Durham or whether you're chief executive of, the, of an oil and gas business in the city of London, it doesn't really matter if you like the values, you could support it. So I think there's going to be exciting change within our political structure over the next five years. I might be completely wrong. You might interview me again in five yeah. years. And I'll say I was completely wrong, <laughs> but it could still happen. I once, I once made a prediction to my local music shop um, owner and I said your country and western's definitely coming back it's definitely coming back and he said no it won't and he was right so, <laughs> so I might be completely wrong I well, just pontificate what could be it's all about context isn't it yeah. I'm sure somewhere it came back just not in that particular yeah, you're shot right. you're right um, well you know I'm a big fan of of the idea of a, a, a values based political party I think it you know, in these disruptive times we have it, it makes more sense than the old model and I think breaking things it is vitally important within that um, do you think with your experience of of government and politics even if you had that would it change anything or would the civil service just homogenize stuff no offense to the civil service mm -hmm. but you know the system itself isn't just we we pretend it's about politics but it's actually about a much larger system. Is that system fit for purpose? Or does that need to change? Do we need to break more than just the people we elect? That, again, is another really good question. Um, and purely in my opinion, I, I think there's, there's a lot of incredible stuff that our civil service does. And you're absolutely right. They, are, they do drive and deliver the framework for our lives. There's a huge amount of waste still, um, routinely hundreds of thousands wasted on projects. Um, the, the need to duck behind a budget figure means you sort of abandon a billion pounds worth of, of different things. So there's an awful lot of waste in, within there still. Um, there is an awful lot of control of what goes on. So speaking from a local government point of view, um, the officers in the local authority I, I, I was a councillor for, the officers were really great, really good. They knew how to run the local authority and they ran it well. And what our council did and what I think council should do and what government ministers should do is set the strategy very clearly and say, I want you to deliver this. And undoubtedly undoubtedly the yes minister sort of thing of oh, yeah. you know yes of course well it, that's not how it's been done over the very very many years so far and and i really don't see how we could 
I think there's got to be an energy to break through because it's very establishment. It is the establishment. And the idea of breaking the, breaking the crystal vase and picking bits out of a, of a department, it, it, it's a very, very tough one for them to do. But I don't think they ever will do if they're not challenged by something new and something radical. Yeah. And that radical stuff could come from one of the major parties. If, um, if there is a... If we find a, a new charismatic values driven leader stepping into either of the two main parties they could be leading this change and this transformation that that could be the other thing that that sort of happens but so let's the, let's stay with that for a second yeah. what do you think the leadership qualities would need to be not necessarily about a, a party leader or the person to lead this change but i'm also hearing almost on a micro level within organizations there's a different style of leadership that's perhaps needed over the next few years what are those qualities at, at either side so if, if i had a message for any of the leadership be they political or business it's dare to think about doing things differently because we've got to because it's a different world that we're in now i like that so let's let's sort of um extend that a little bit further to change and you know, the big question we often ask is how does change happen and i know you've you've talked a little bit about this but you know are there particular methodologies that you favor or any thing like that or if, if you think about the principle of change how does it actually happen my immediate response is you've got to you've got to see the change you've got to be prepared to see a change you've got to have an inspirational leader that's that's looking wider that's looking at more opportunities there's got to be somebody in an organization that's bringing crazy ideas through the funnel and is bringing them into the people that will then administer a change process uh, i'm slightly worried that if you take process too far up the stack then nobody is being free thinking and inspirational and daring to, to break things because you're moribound by a process system. I worked in an organization once that it felt like it required 16 gateways to get a simple idea from the shop floor out to the customer. And by the time you've been through 16 gateway change processes, you lose the will to live, yes. the market's moved on, somebody more nimble has gone out and stolen the market. So I, I think it's by all means, utilize the change processes that work for you as an organization, depending on your sector and, and your, your area. But don't allow that to stifle creativity by becoming too moribund at the top, which might be a problem the civil service have in some places. OK, right. I th we're getting towards the end of our time together. I'm curious, have you noticed any differences as millennials are entering the workforce how do organizations have to change and evolve uh, in order to accommodate them or different ways of working you see sort of uh, pictures and you see um, mickey takes of, of organizations that are rolling around in zorbing balls and they've got table tennis tables and you go into one or two office companies and they've got bars there where you can go and help yourself to beer which is all great it's all yeah. really you know it's really good stuff but i think if you if you end up building a business thinking I've got to make an allowance for the millennials, then you're, you're not actually building your business, you're creating a playground. Uh, I think there's an awful lot of exciting new talent coming through. And I think the value, coming back to your question, the value that millennials bring to the workplace right now is that they've grown up in this world. They didn't know anything before mobile phones giving you access to everything you need, being able to sit on a train and watch movies and, um, uh, communicate with all your friends to even now moving away from well desktops a while ago even now moving away from laptops to just working everything on the mobile device that you've got in front of you and that brings an ability to think differently to find different solutions mm. to think about doing things in a different way and, and it's almost perhaps every chief executive of big state organizations needs to employ a PA who's a millennial to, to use your term that will come in and sit next to them and just question their decisions. You bring in a 19, 20, 25 year old who just says, why, why are you doing it like that then? Why, why are you doing it like this? And just keep prodding these people. Perhaps a lot of them would, would benefit from having a, a millennial prodding the chief executive saying, what did you do that for? And that's an interesting idea. Why? why? And yes. keep that question. Why? Why are you doing it like that? What are you doing that for? How else could we do it? 
And I, and I think there's, there's a lot of value in those things, but there's an awful lot of people that wrap themselves up in their position, wrap themselves up in their crystal vase and say, I'm, I'm safe till retirement now, I'm not going to rock the boat and therefore won't engage in change and, and won't engage with what millennials have to offer. Does that answer your question? It does indeed. I, I really <laughs> like it. I, I was going to ask you another question, but that almost nicely brings our conversation it's probably because I've run the tape out by yeah, my exactly. waffling. Really. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mason's gone off and got lunch. I've been all this time I've been chatting. <laughs> well, again, yeah, that's definitely... Mason often asks me the question, well, why are we doing it like that? Because so, we do. Uh, okay, let's change it. Um, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, Marcus. Thank As you we always do so we much. Yeah. Um, let's go off for lunch, have some more conversation. You guys don't get to join us for that but um, really really appreciate your time and thanks Brilliant. for all of your wisdom thank you Neil I'm not sure it's called wisdom but it's it's there for what it's worth so, uh, <laughs> Neil thank you so much for inviting me good luck with pleasure all, and see you again look forward to the adventure ahead cheers thank you for listening to this 91 untold change project podcast i'm neil armand uh, if you've enjoyed it please subscribe you can also keep in touch with our adventures on social or at 91untold.com thank you for listening and we look forward to the adventures ahead yeah.